Montero, and I'm going to make you feel good today. That is our destination. However, it may not be a direct route. I might have to make you feel shitty before I can make you feel good. You'll survive it. You'll be fine. So I'm going to start this story by talking about my dad. And the first car that I remember my dad driving was a 1973 Plymouth Fury. It was blue, as big as a boat. You could easily fit four people across the back seat and it smelled like cigarettes. He bought it used, but he looked good in it, which is probably why he bought it. So my father was a vain man. He is a vain man. And because I love you all, I'm gonna show you something very embarrassing. That's me on the left, and that's the Fury behind me. Um, cops also loved the Plymouth Fury. There it is. So I grew up in Philadelphia. It got terrible gas mileage, which hadn't become a concern for most people yet, at least in a big picture fossil fuel emissions kind of way. We were still a little sore at that point about losing the Vietnam War, and we needed something to remind us what it felt like to be American. And I guess large cars kind of did the trick. Cyber trucks do it now. <laughs> now, the shitty gas mileage did matter in a small picture way, though, because my father was a construction worker in Philadelphia where the ground freezes over in the winter and construction stops, and so do paychecks. And it took a lot of gas to fill that car's tank. And I remember one particular winter morning, we'd been hit by a snowstorm a few days earlier and the, and the streets were still covered with snow. The city of Philadelphia didn't exactly rush to plow our immigrant neighborhood. And so my father decided to drive us to school and we all piled in the car, me and my two brothers, and we got yelled at for not kicking the snow off our shoes before climbing in. And he says, we need to stop for gas. So we pulled up to the pump at the AMPM Mini Mart, and my dad pulled out his wallet, grabbed a handful of ones, went through the change compartment, dug out a few quarters and some more change, and said, be right back. And he came back to the car holding a lottery ticket and tucked it into the crack in the dashboard foam that he used for all of his important paperwork. Some of you may remember that. And we drove off to school. And he says, hopefully, we hit the numbers tonight. My dad lived on hope. He never had a 401k, he never saved, he never really had enough money to save, to be honest. He spent most of his life without insurance of any sort, never planned much. But he had a lot of hope in outside forces. My father's life story was full of magical realism where utility bill money showed up at the last minute a loan could always be gotten. My mother could always find some other reason to forgive him. And someone else would always jump in at the last second to take care of the shit that he was responsible for. Hope is believing that other people will act on our behalf. Hope is a reliance on deus ex machina. Hope is lack of planning. Hope is keeping us from dealing with our own shit. Hope is responsibility deferred. I was reminded of this when I was having a conversation <laughs> with a Facebook employee and they said this, We've been behaving so badly that I hope the government comes in and regulates us. There's that word, hope. So yes, you can hope 
that the government comes in at some point and regulates your job. And to be clear, they probably should because we now have a body count. And they will eventually. But waiting for them to solve the problem is responsibility deferred. Ultimately, hope is giving ourselves permission to do nothing. Regulation, if, if done right, is going to take years. And we don't have years to sort out this mess. And additionally, the current administration is using regulation as a threat. Mark Zuckerberg had two secret meetings. There it is. Two secret meetings with Donald Trump that we know of where regulation was used as a stick to keep Facebook from vetting political ads. Facebook's decision to not fact check political ads came after that first secret meeting. And in the second meeting, oh, they were joined by Peter Thiel, the CEO of Palantir, the company that builds immigrant tracking databases for ICE. So yes, regulation is the answer, eventually. But asking for it now is like putting the fox in charge of the chicken coop. It's like asking your cancer to be in charge of your emission plan. The reason, the reasons that we hope someone else is coming to solve our problems are also worth going into. For one, these problems seem insurmountable. Take Facebook, for example. No one has ever built a social network that connects 2.5 billion people before. 2.5 billion. Much less a social network that profits from the data harvested from those 2.5 billion people. It's uncharted fuckery. And finding yourself inside that situation has to be dawning and isolating. There's a reason that they call you individual contributors. It's to make you feel alone. Except you're not alone. You're part of a giant workforce. And you also didn't find yourself there. You actively chose to work there, which brings with it a set of ethical responsibilities. And if you're hoping that somebody else comes in and solves those problems, it means you're aware the problems exist. And as the person hired to build the machine, it's on you to correct the machine's actions when it goes off the rails. Look around at the people working with you. They all chose to work where they're working. Everyone there made a decision to take that job. And when you take a job, you got to do it right. And the odds that you're the only person there hoping for change are pretty slim. Start talking to each other, communicate, work together. You are not individual contributors. You're a workforce, and a united workforce can accomplish things that individuals cannot. Secondly, the repercussions are real. If you take a stand against the company, they have a million ways to fire you. That's real. And as much as I don't want you to lose your job, I'm not willing to sign off on you doing it wrong just so that you don't lose it. If you're willing to lie to people so that you don't get fired, you don't deserve that job. And you certainly shouldn't be anywhere near a machine that can do that much damage. I have seen too many instances of designers at big companies complaining about being unfairly maligned and shamed for just doing their jobs. Apparently, when you face consequences for deceiving people, it hurts your feelings. Oh. 
if you're a designer, if you're in, if you're in tech, this work cannot be about your feelings. And frankly, your feelings are exhausting. As is the imposter syndrome that drives you to look for validation. You earned the job the day that you were hired. You earned the paycheck, but you also earned the responsibility that comes with doing it. Now you got to do it. Here's the thing about shaming somebody, though. It's like watering a seed. So the sun can shine on dirt all day long, and you can water that dirt all you want. But unless there's a seed in the dirt, nothing's going to grow. If you try to shame me about wearing glasses, it wouldn't work because I need glasses to see. So take that, elementary school friends. <laughs> if you try to shame me about watching too much TV, well, you might get a little traction. I probably do watch a little bit too much TV, but ultimately, fuck it, because I enjoy watching TV. However, however, if you caught me smoking a cigarette and shamed me about it, that would totally work because that's a horrible habit and I shouldn't be doing it. And for the record, I don't. I stopped doing it decades ago, but it's a good example and I hope we can all agree on it. So I went with it. <laughs> Something tells me that the employees at Facebook already feel shame, just not enough to do anything about it yet. Every single employee at Facebook knows where the money for their paychecks comes from and has for a very long time now. And it's fair to assume that if they're still there, they're okay with it. Let's go back to our cigarette metaphor for a second. So that's me. Um, <laughs> so I smoked from college into my 40s and at, at no point, at no point, did I think it wasn't an awful habit? I knew. At, at no point could I look at the evidence and decide that it was an okay thing to do. Luckily, I was alive during an era in which attitudes about smoking were shifting rapidly. It went from something most people did on, on planes. You could smoke on planes. Anybody remember that? But only in the last three, because then the bad air would stay in the back to something that people tolerated other people doing, to something we now ban from most places where people congregate. There was an undeniable realization that smoking harmed not just the smoker, but everybody around the smoker. Your actions harmed everybody around you. And the pressure to quit smoking kind of came from society shaming me for smoking. And I am grateful for that. And I am more than grateful for that. I'm probably alive because of that. Would I have quit without the public shaming? Maybe, maybe, but I just don't know. But I think we can all agree that society as a whole is healthier because of a coordinated campaign to publicly shame smokers and decrease the places where they could smoke. So what's this got to do with being a tech worker? Well, it's easy, addiction. When a highly paid tech worker tells you that they have the right to earn a living, oh my God, they love telling you that. There's a phrase missing. In the manner to which I've grown addicted. You do have a right to earn a living, but so do the refugees and immigrants cataloged in the database tech workers at Palantir built for ICE. You don't have a right to earn a living by denying others their right to earn a living. And you don't have a right to earn a living that's a hundred times better than anybody else. The most important word in the phrase, everyone has a right to earn a living, is everyone. Now, the upper echelon of tech workers earns a very good living. And this isn't to say that there aren't 
tremendous problems with pay disparity along gender lines, racial lines, and many, many, many other lines. There are, and those problems need to be fixed. But the minimum wage in San Francisco, where I live, is $15.59 an hour. By the way, if you're thinking that sounds good, a one bedroom apartment will go $4,500 a month. The minimum wage in California, the rest of California is $12 an hour. And the minimum wage in the US is $7.25 an hour. By those standards, tech workers earn a very good living. But what about the people who earn a living from our work? Our work is enabling one of the highest wealth disparities in history. DoorDash workers are taking home $1.45 an hour. And by the way, if you have to use uh, things, services like this, tip those people in cash and tip them well. As workers, we need to realize that we have more in common with other workers like this than with our bosses. We need to stop behaving like temporarily embarrassed millionaires or CEOs or entrepreneurs because we're actually embarrassing ourselves as human beings. And yes, I realize that many of you are saddled with student debt and medical costs, and that shit is real. But the, the solution to that is not to do the corporation's work. It's to break the system in which a corporation can trade your debt for complicity. And yes, for those of us living in the Bay Area who say that our rents are too high, they are. They're definitely too high for anyone earning minimum wage to afford. And but tech workers complaining about the high cost of housing is not unlike a cancer cell complaining about a host body deteriorating. You are not Jean Valjean. You are not a loaf of bread away from your family dying of hunger. Your Peloton subscription and Cybertruck deposit don't fit Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have a right to earn a living, but not in the manner to which you've become addicted. Your point is moot. So yes, I am a privileged white guy. I will own that, I have to own that. Doors open for me. I have never, never had to prove that I belong somewhere. I have never been followed by a security guard when I walk into a store. I have never feared for my life when getting into a rideshare vehicle. I've never been afraid to leave my drink unattended at a bar to go to the bathroom. And I've never been hassled for being in a bathroom. Somebody decided I didn't have a right to be in. I own all that shit. And I get that many people hearing this talk have climbed hurdles that I never had to climb to get where they are today, and I totally fucking respect that. But clearing those hurdles does not give anyone a right to pass, a, a, it does not give anyone a pass to work on tools that abuse, harass, and spread lies. Now on December 31st of 2019, Recode <laughs> reported that 2,300 Google cafeteria workers had unionized. 2,300 Google cafeteria workers, tired of being underpaid, tired of being overworked. They organized themselves and they reached out to a local chapter of Unite Here which represents cafeteria workers, hotel workers, and other hospitality workers all over North America. I hope the people in back are listening. And they're now going to be able to bargain collectively. They're going to be able to demand better working conditions collectively and get paid 
what they deserve. And any of those things, any of those things are monumental tasks when you act individually. But collectively, your chances at success are much, much higher. These options are available to all workers. You are workers. On January 7th, 2020, the Los Angeles Times reported that the Communications Workers of America, the CWA, one of America's biggest labor unions, had launched a major initiative to unionize tech workers and gaming workers. Organizing and working collectively is our best chance to deal away with that seed of shame that's growing inside workers who realize their paychecks aren't earned in a manner that they can feel good about. Leadership will not change. They have no reason to. The current system is working great for them. WeWork founder Adam Newman got a $1.7 billion payout for failing. That is privilege at work. And yes, the people involved in that transaction should be ashamed of themselves, but they're not. And they never will be. They're not capable of it, but you are, or you wouldn't be getting mad at me right now. That sense of dread that starts building on a Sunday afternoon, knowing that tomorrow you'll have to go to work and you'll have to build tools that harass people and lie to people and help cage people that little feeling right there, that's shame. Now, I'm not here to shame you. I don't need to. You're doing it to yourself. I'm here to tell you that you have more power and more strength than you believe you have. This is a hard time to be a designer. I put that in just for you, Alberto, just for you. And by the way, anybody here who's thinking, I came here to see a goddamn design talk and now he's talking politics and thinking I'm gonna go complain to Alberto. Let's remember, this is the dick who brought politics into hurricane maps. So fair fucking game. <laughs> If you are afraid to fight, this might not be the right time for you to be a designer. If you are afraid to do your job ethically, this might not be the right time for you to be a designer. If you are afraid to speak truth to power, this might not be the right time for you to be a designer. If you are afraid to be judged by the impact of your work, this might not be the right time for you to be a designer. If you are afraid to stand up for the ones who need you the most, this might not be the right time to be a designer. Find another way to earn your living. Tap out. Let there be no shame in that. But if you are ready to do the right thing, look around you because there are other people in this room who feel the same way. Organize. You want it to change the world? Here's your chance. You want it to disrupt? Disrupt the system that's covering you in shame. You don't work for the people who sign your checks. You work for the people who use the products of your labor. If I were to put my hope into one thing, it's that you understand the importance of this. Your job is to look out for the people who your work is affecting. And that is a responsibility that we cannot defer. Look, I started this talk 
with a story about my father and I didn't, I didn't paint him in the best light. My relationship with my father is complicated, but it's been considerably smoothed over by both time and therapy. <laughs> but for all the questionable decisions he made in his life, and trust me, I've made plenty of my own, this is the same man who got on a plane with my mom, two infants and $200 in his pocket because he hoped that the United States would be a better place to raise those infants. But that was hope combined with a plan and a lack of fear to act. It took the combination of all three. Hope by itself would have meant doing nothing. It's the difference between hoping for the best and hoping that our plan works. So I can vouch that at least once, my father coupled hope with a plan, and I'm grateful to him for that. When 22,000 Google employees staged a walkout, it gave me hope. When Microsoft workers successfully protested their company's ICE contract, it gave me hope. When Amazon warehouse workers went on strike, it gave me hope. Hope is earned by action. And when you stand up against bad practices in your workplace, you earn hope. When you act to organize your workplace, you earn hope. When you're willing to risk your own comfort for the dignity of others, you earn hope. When you take action, you earn hope hope. But hoping that other people who are clearly benefiting from how they've designed the world will change their behavior is lost hope. Hoping that enough crumbs will fall from billionaires' tables is lost hope. Hoping that others will do what we don't have the courage, resolve, and confidence to do is lost hope. More importantly, it's responsibility deferred. This is the job that we signed up for. We need a plan. <laughs> then we need to act. Then hope is earned. Until then, it's just keeping us from acting. The promise of the internet was that it was going to give a voice to the voiceless, visibility to the invisible, and power to the powerless. That's what originally excited me about it, and I'm guessing that's what originally excited some of you about it. It was supposed to be an engine of equity and democracy. Suddenly, suddenly, anybody could tell their story. Suddenly, anybody could sing their song. Suddenly that one weird kid in Trondheim, Norway could find another weird kid just like him in Bakersfield, California, and they could talk and they could know that they weren't alone. Suddenly we didn't need anybody's permission to publish. We put our stories and our songs and our messages and our artwork where the world could find them. And for a while, it was beautiful, and it was messy, but holy shit, it was punk as fuck. We rolled up our sleeves, and we helped to build this. This is the internet in 2020. Toxic anger, hate, actual motherfucking Nazis, At no point did I think we would fuck that up. Stolen data, gender reveal parties, monstrously large corporations behaving monstrously badly, and the United States' first actual internet president 
willfully allowed to rise to power because the web is ruled by engagement and run by idiots who wrap themselves in free speech while not understanding what the fuck it means. Fascists may have rolled into town, but they rolled in on roads built by libertarians. And meanwhile, because that wasn't enough, we actually broke the planet. So is there a road back? Do we have a shot? We may, on the most optimistic of days, have the smallest sliver of a shot. If we aim correctly and blot out all the anxiety and despair surrounding us, we may even be able to see it. A small, tiny glimmer of hope, thin as a thread, is there. I was recently reading um, Jonathan Safran Foer's We Are the Weather, uh, Saving the Planet Begins at Breakfast, which posits the same questions, but about, about climate change. Do we have a chance? And his answer is much the same. We have a definite maybe, but only, only if we start right now agree on what action to take, and don't hesitate. And honestly, that does not sound like a very good chance to me. We've only rarely been able to do one of those things. And all three combined seems impossible. And in the book, he tells the story, and I mean, this is a trope that we've all heard by now of, of a, a woman in a, in a car accident who manages to lift the car to save her child who's trapped under it. And she exhibits superhuman strength simply because not saving the child is impossible for her to consider. When failure becomes unthinkable, success, no matter how unlikely, becomes the only possibility. We don't have much of a chance here, but not succeeding is unthinkable. So we have to consider what success might look like as it's the only option left. So grab that small sliver of a shot and hang on with all the strength you don't realize you have yet because you do have it. It won't be easy and you won't like it, but holy shit, if it works, we might have a shot. The world was broken on our watch. That's non-negotiable because we don't have time to negotiate the point. We were given the responsibility to use our labor and our expertise to make the world a better place and we failed. We have, in fact, made it worse. You are forever responsible for the work your labor produces, and if you're not okay with that, I implore you to stop producing work. On December 3rd, ProPublica published a story about the ongoing work McKinsey Consulting was doing for ICE. It included recommendations that apparently were insane enough to make people who keep babies in cages uncomfortable. The money, and it said, the money-saving recommendations the consultants came up with made some career ICE staff uncomfortable. They proposed cuts in spending on food for migrants as well as on medical care. A few days later, McKinsey published their rebuttal that basically said the story wasn't true. Now, I've worked with ProPublica. They're passionately committed to the truth. They wouldn't have published a word of that story if they weren't absolutely certain of it. And McKinsey reacted the way that organizations like McKinsey react, deny everything and wait for the next news cycle, which will probably inevitably contain news of another company doing something even worse probably Facebook. Now, Twitter employees love 
posting pictures of events at the workplace, and they seem to have a lot of events. And those, post, those pictures are usually accompanied with the hashtag, love where you work, which I'm sure is something the company encourages. Uh, both the events and the hashtag are meant to inspire a sense of workplace community, as well as show the world how happy all the employees are. Oh, stay away, ye union organizer, ye shall find no purchase here. The same with the free meals, the offsites, the kombucha on tap, the homey surroundings, all the other perks. Love where you work, they say, and try to forget that we're using your labor to line our shareholders' pockets while destroying society. Now, obviously, this isn't limited to Twitter. Tech companies are known for their sprawling, luxurious campuses with lots of perks because people need community. We're herd animals. We need to be around each other. We like to surround ourselves with others and preferably others that we share common interests and causes and backgrounds. Now, this isn't always good. Sometimes we define our communities by skin color and who it excludes. So beware of that. But communities tend to look out for each other and they circle the wagons when the community is in trouble. Now, tech companies have hijacked this, this notion of community, and they've done this by design. Most tech workers are first and foremost members of their company community. The company looks out for them, and they protect the company's interest. So when people attack Facebook, their companies feel their community is under attack. Facebook, I don't know if you heard this story, but they were even nice enough to build a chat bot for their employees to help them deal with uh, difficult questions that they were getting from their families when they went home for Thanksgiving. Uh, the only other organization that I can think of that reaches that level of family management is Scientology, by the way. <laughs> and if anybody here is a Scientologist, why the hell are you here? <laughs> Stop loving where you work. Love where you live and don't live at work. Our true community, the people in our neighborhood, the people who make and deliver our food, the people who educate our children, the people who put out our fires, the people who run our corner markets, the people who clean our streets, the people who come to us seeking refuge and safety, and the people who sleep in our streets because our society has disenfranchised them, that is our true community. Those are the people that we need to be protecting. Mark Zuckerberg does not need your fucking protection. Facebook does not need you to protect them, but our brothers and sisters on the street do. Stop using your talent and labor to put your brothers and sisters in cages. Now, Mark Zuckerberg, he might be good at coding, at least I think he is. The last thing I know that he coded was a, a website for rating co-eds, which turned into Facebook. Uh, and I'm sure Jack Dorsey is probably good at something too. But both those fools are terrible at interpersonal relationships which makes it appalling that they're both in charge of platforms that rely on understanding how human beings relate to each other. They've both proven that this is not in their wheelhouse. And just like none of us would, would, would no longer let our barbers do our dental work, which is a thing we once did, or let our, our, our pets do our tax work, which is hopefully not a thing we once did, it's time to understand that the challenge of the web is no longer a technical challenge and that being good at the technical stuff does not automatically make you a savant in socioeconomic policy. The web is about people and how those people interact with one another. The web is about power dynamics. The web is about society and its discontents. The next wave of people running the web need to understand human relationships more than anything else. And they need to come from groups. They need to come from groups that are currently marginalized. 
white men had our chance and we fucked it up. We do not get to complain. I originally wrote this talk in a cafe in, in San Francisco, and there were at least three adjacent tables having conversations about funding. Uh, I wasn't eavesdropping. The conversations are meant to be heard. They're a social mating call. <laughs> oh, look at me, I'm a founder. I'm raising capital. Look at me, I'm an angel investor. Look at me, I'm biohacking. I'm fine, I'm building the next Uber, but for cats. <laughs> it was at this same cafe where I once heard a young guy complaining to another young guy that he was worried he turned 30 before he made his first million. That's not normal. That's not sustainable, and more importantly, that's not good. For generation upon generation, people built and ran businesses trying to make more than they spent, trying to increase that a little bit year after year, all the while trying to attempting to adapt to customers' ever-changing needs and desires. And multiply that with a lot of luck and divide, divide it by a whole lot of racist and sexist bullshit about who could get business loans and leases. But in a nutshell, that's how we've built businesses throughout civilization. And the entire goal was to make sure that the generation that was coming up after you got a chance to do a little bit better than you did. But you build things one step at a time with the steady stubbornness and sure-footedness of a good working mule. By the way, does anybody realize that our parents were teaching us about the glory of cannibalism <laughs> with these Richard Scarry books? Because that's fucked up. But the internet was a whole new history and it was exciting and exciting things grow quickly and money shows up fast. Suddenly, every boy in a hoodie had the next potential great idea. And if you could get a good grip on his, his, his short hairs and it's always his early and right by the base, you stood a good chance to get 10 times richer. So the investments came fast and they came easy. And suddenly these cut a little runs we're managing millions of dollars and thousands of people and hundreds of problems with absolutely no idea how. But in the world of venture capital, this doesn't really matter. As long as we push the hog into the slaughter chute before the inspector realizes it's riddled with worms, we still get paid for the meat. Travis Kalanick, formerly of Uber, a company responsible for 3,045 sexual assaults, nine murders, and 58 people killed in crashes in the last year alone, was allowed to walk away with almost $3 billion. Jack Dorsey, who built a $4 billion fortune by enabling President Donald Trump and the alt-right to use his platform for spreading abuse and hatred, now intends to spend the, the 2020 election yoga babbling, fasting, and downward dog whistling in Africa. And Zuckerberg turned a website for rating the hotness of college women into an engine for destroying democracy and our privacy and a $74 billion bank account. And lo, we cannot completely put, these at, put this at these idiots' feet. As Professor Scott Galloway recently said in an article in Business Insider, if you tell a 30 or 40-something person who regularly wears black turtlenecks that they are Steve Jobs, they are inclined to believe you. The venture capitalists who raised these sick hogs did even better financially. And in the end, none of these services exist as anything other than a means to make their investors richer. And all of them are a strain on society. And that's okay because in the end, the only thing any of those companies were actually expected to do was to make their investors rich. You as a worker, were not even a part of this equation. You were seen 
as a drain on resources. You didn't make the cut. And at the same time, WeWork was paying Adam Newman a billion dollars to go away from the company at the same time that they were paying him a billion dollars to go away from the company that he ran into the ground, it was laying off 2,400 workers. They don't care about you. The current system is not working. It rewards cowardice, betrayal, and avarice. The people working at the top will never change because they have no reason to. The system is working for them. But it works by making the rich richer and the poor poorer. It works by increasing the chasm between the haves and the have-nots. It works by preying on the people who need our support the most. We have built the entire service economy on the premise of abusing poor people. And that was us. That's where we've been putting our labor. I promised you a small sliver of hope, and I am going to give it to you. And that small sliver of hope rests on our relationship with those very people that we've been exploiting. And as corny as this may sound, that small sliver of hope is love. The people we've been exploiting are workers, and we're workers. And we will not use our labor to exploit other workers. We need to love other workers. We need to love that we are workers. We need to love the people who've been jailed by our face tracking tech more than we love the people who are paying us to build it. We need to love the people the pharmaceuticals are paying us to get addicted to opioids more than we love the money they're willing to pay us for it. We need to love the people who get harassed and abused on a daily basis on Twitter more than we love where we work. We need to love the people who are getting hoodwinked and bamboozled by the lies we're allowing on Facebook more than we love the perks of working at Facebook. We need to love our neighbors, our corner grocer, our local restaurants started by a refugee family, and the disenfranchised sleeping on our streets more then we love our boss, our manager, and the HR department. They do not care about you. They will fire you to increase their quarterly profit by a hundredth of a percent. These people are not your friends. Love your community and love those who need the most love with the most love. We need to love the sound of our own voice enough to use it to question what we are being asked to do and to say no to bad ideas. When our fellow worker tells our boss that they will not use their labor to exploit someone, we need to love them enough to stand by them in solidarity. We need to love our children enough that we are not willing to destroy their future by helping Facebook elect a climate change denier. And ultimately, ultimately, we need to love ourselves enough to know that when management attempts to put their foot on our necks, we will be standing too tall and too proud for them to reach. The promise of the internet was that it was going to give voice to the voiceless, visibility to the invisible, and power to the powerless. That's what I hope excited you about it as well. And I hope that some of that excitement is still there. But as we've learned, hope by itself is worthless. We need a plan and we need it soon. And that plan is to recognize ourselves as workers, organize ourselves as workers, love one another, 
know that we have each other's backs, demand decency from management, and be ready to put down the tools if we are asked to harm our fellow brothers and sisters. When you raise your voice, you will be amazed how far it carries. We don't really have time to argue about it. The things we can still save are very much worth saving. It would be unthinkable not to save them. It will be hard. It will be close to impossible, but we can't fail because when failure becomes impossible, success, no matter how unlikely, becomes the only possibility. We wanted to change the world. We have just enough time to take one shot. Let's make it count. Thank you. <laughs>